have a <laughs> I I do have a few slides so, so that we're all like, kind of going down the same uh, trail together. But you know, if we if we peel off and and speak from the heart, all all good will come from it anyway. So good morning, and I'm going to go ahead and um, actually before I share my slides. Uh, if we could have Kenna, Amanda, and Kent just share in a few minutes. Um, why did you choose this presentation out of all the many? And um, what's your background? What field are you in? A little bit about your institution. Awesome. I can go first if that's yeah. fine. Um, so my name is Kenna Kessler. I am just starting my second year teaching here at Utah State University. I teach in agricultural communications, um, pretty much all the communications classes in the College of Ag. Um, I joined this particular um, presentation because I teach a very, very large class. I teach 175 students sprinkled pretty much all throughout the world. I've had students chiming in from China, from Korea. With the pandemic, a lot of students have gone home and they're they're Zooming in. Um, and I have five TAs who help me with this class, um, TAs and UTFs, and, and so I'd love to learn how to use them more in order to make it a more inclusive environment and how to just make my teaching more inclusive in general, since I have people from all different backgrounds in my classes. Okay, wonderful. Amanda or Kent? Yeah, I can go next. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Amanda Dawson, she, her, and I am a first year faculty member at Utah State in the Department of Theater Arts. Um, this is my 15th year teaching, but my first year at Utah State. And it's my first year though I've ever had um, UTFs. I've never worked with an undergraduate teaching assistant or anything. I've been a teaching assistant a lot as a graduate student back in the day, um, but never have utilized them myself. So I'm kind of constantly figuring out how best to use them. Fortunately, most of the UTFs in the theater department are future theater educators. They're theater ed students. So that's helpful because I can be like, you can teach a class for today. Um, but in terms of how to use them outside of like actually teaching and taking attendance, just looking for some additional resources to do that. My classes are not the same size as um, Kenna's. Mine are much smaller. So my biggest class is like 26 students. So we don't have the need to like break them all up into smaller groups, but just looking for some additional resources. Okay. And Kent. Yeah, so my name is Kent Hinkson. I'm at Utah Valley University. I'm actually a, a PhD candidate at the University of Utah right now, uh, finishing up my uh, degree in clinical psychology. But I've been teaching at Utah Valley University since 2015 as an adjunct uh, in statistics and research methods, which are much smaller classes, but sometimes require a lot of hands-on uh, assistance. And so uh, I'm actually interested in, in um, teaching assistants because I had such a great experience as a teaching uh, assistant. And I really believe that it's an opportunity for uh, extremely engaged learning on their part as they're kind of continuing uh, to, to learn the material. And as they're tutoring and helping others, they're uh, cementing the information that they have themselves. And so mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in learning how to help other people grow in this unusual and, and different learning environment um, rather than the actual students who are learning from this but using the UTA as a, a position for the, the that teaching assistant themselves to learn more so absolutely okay so wonderful so so Kent I, I failed to when I introduce myself to say that I too am a psychologist uh, sensation and perception co learning cognition environmental psychology when I can sneak it in. And, um, and so I'm curious, your, Kent, your teaching assistant experience, was that as an undergrad or you're saying as a graduate student? Most of mine was as an undergrad. I've actually been teaching as an adjunct so much that I um, haven't been uh, teaching as a, a teaching assistant. I am currently um, the, the, the quote unquote teaching assistant for um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. on the clinical side of psychology. And so mm -hmm. I'm teaching second year PhD students how to um, be better therapists. And so uh, I watch a lot of film in, in that capacity, so. Okay, okay, wonderful. And Kenna, um, I hear you with the large student, the large classes. I, I do have some smaller grad level classes, but my, um, when we switched to remote learning, I combined sections of my already large uh, undergrad learning and cognition. And so that's at 252 right now in, in one mega section. And so having smaller pods 
with an undergraduate teaching assistant in charge of each pod has been instrumental. And Amanda, that makes a lot of sense with your smaller classes that you're not necessarily grouping them, but perhaps there's different roles that different undergraduate teaching assistants could take either there's a skill set they want to develop before they head out on their own, or um, they already bring in that strength and they want to strengthen it even more. So thank you for those introductions. I'm going to probably find the right screen to share. How's that? Did I, did I, does this look like what we're talking about? Okay, great. And, I don't know if you've ever had that experience when you change slides, you know, you go ahead and change slides, but your students are still looking at your old one. Okay, so I have a QR code here on the bottom. There's a few links that I have um, just that I'm using as reference points to make sure we are talking a common language about inclusive and equitable teaching. So uh, this is just going to a Google Doc. You can go ahead and scan it now. If you don't want to, that's fine. And I can email it to you later. There we go. Okay, so the outcomes that I have for today, and I realize we only have 20-ish minutes now left. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time exchanging our working definitions for inclusion and equitable teaching. And when I submitted this, presentation, I was going with inclusive, but upon further reflection, it's really inclusive and equitable. We'll explore how UTAs can, in fact, assist in this, and then how it might not be necessary, because it sounds like most of you have UTAs already to create within your institution. It was not a thing, or at least not in my department when I started, and I have a interesting story about how I made it happen, but it might not be necessary because it sounds like you, you already have that part. And I'm a very much, um, feel free to jump in and make a comment right away kind of leader here. Let me move this far. So let's just take a few minutes and you don't have to vocalize for either or both of these or neither, whatever your preference. But when we are talking about an inclusive classroom, what are we, what are we striving for with that? You know, Ellen, for me, I think I, I try to I try to put myself in that space that my students are not me, that um, they don't have the same experience as me, that they their approach to their education isn't the same as mine was when I was a student. Um, and just just recognizing just the range of students in the classroom and and trying to keep that in mind and thinking about what am I doing and how, how is it trying to speak to as many people in the, in the room as I can? Thank you for getting us started. I, some of those things that you said really res resonated with me. The, the acknowledgement that our past that got us to where we are right now um, is not very likely that our current students have had that, those, whether it's opportunities or you face barriers, their barriers may be different. And so to acknowledge, I know for myself, when I look back and say, wow, you know, I had a lot of privilege to get me here. Um, and hard work could get me where I wanted to go. But uh, many of today's students don't have that privilege. Mm -hmm. I really like some of the things you said there, Matt. Anyone else want to add? I think excuse me, sorry. Um, I think for me, an inclusive learning classroom is really just making a learning environment that's both safe and welcoming to, to everyone in that class. Maybe not necessarily comfortable because I still want them to be pushed and stretched and go outside their comfort zone, but that they know that their opinions and their voices are heard and that they matter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that word safe, that, that's really an important one. And we 
can provide that feeling of safety in the preparation and the documents that we share with them and that what we're doing in real life and in any kind of written or video feedback we give them to be reinforcing that it's a safe environment. Okay, so yeah, lots of words here, but just the idea, everything you do matters, like I said, through the design phase. Um, so the way that you, also the way you ask your students to demonstrate their learning. I've moved away from online exams while we're remote learning, and that's a whole other topic of itself, but acknowledging that there's other ways to demonstrate. And this idea of not privileging some students while disadvantaging others. Okay, and then just a few more minutes then. Um, talked about inclusivity, equitable versus um, equal treatment of students. What, what, either by example of some things you've done to try to make it equitable or what what is an equitable classroom look like to you? So I talked to my students about um, that well, things well. aren't equal and that they will be equitable and that it will be uncomfortable because that's not how we've done things usually. And that we, um, that there are students that will need more from me than other students. Um, and that that's okay that they need more. Um, and it doesn't mean that I don't want to give to all students. Um, and so we have a real conversation where we talk about the difference between equity and equitable. I mean, an equity and equal equality. And so that they understand what that means and what it looks like. Um, and then if it shows up to where people feel uncomfortable because it has shown up before that we have discussions about it and I do more clarification of why I do certain things. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Juwan, Juwon, what's the? Juwan. Juwan, okay, wonderful. Thank you for jumping right in. Welcome to the group. I really like the transparency that you talk about. So, so you're setting the stage of, about why certain uh, interactions or opportunities are being provided so that it is equitable. Yeah, so again, definition here, and, uh, and I've got that QR code if you're interested in exactly these things, but that these building relationships with students that foster community. And back to the topic of this round table, this is where I think undergraduate teaching assistants can really come in. Whether you're talking about Kenna's large class of 175 students broken into smaller groups or Amanda's small class that is already one group, we try to present ourselves as welcoming and open to all of our students, but They've come through a system, and depending on what system they've come through, there is still some fear or they may have some past experiences where they were not treated with respect for their lived experience. And so they might not feel safe coming to us. And that's where I think an undergraduate teaching assistant, a peer, if you will, can be the first person that they can go to to seek clarification or if they're having difficulty or if they need that little nudge to learn that you know, the professor actually is very caring and open-minded and we're all on the same team. We, uh, when students email me, um, you know, the student named Tina, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm asking for this last minute and you know, gives her reason and I, reassure them, I will help them get back up to speed. And at the end, I say, we are all on team Tina. So we are in this together. And having an undergraduate teaching assistant appear, sending that message kind of lays the groundwork for them coming to see you. Okay, so I think Juan already touched on equity versus equality. I wanna move on and talk about Talk about it. So I don't think I really need to share my story of how I got UTAs. Just suffice it to say, the first time I went to my chair and suggested having UTAs, 
because my after my first semester teaching, some students approached me and said, we'd love to be UTAs for you next semester. I said, okay, I'll talk to my chair. And she said, well, they can't grade, so what purpose would they hold? And so I was flat on my feet because I didn't have an answer for that. And it, the seeds started to grow. Wait a minute, there's all these other important roles they can play in building community. So now I have 18 students taking an independent study with me. <laughs> They're my undergraduate teaching assistants. So there is definitely a way to make things happen. So let's um, take our time now talking about what roles can these peer, because they're undergraduate teaching assistants, hold to leverage inclusive and equitable teaching? And then, okay, so how do we select UTAs that can further their feeling of inclusion as part of the academy and their leadership and development for their next steps? I've already mentioned speaking with a peer makes it easier to practice than if they want to approach me. I have also instructed my UTAs that when a student confides something to them, it's with the understanding that it's staying confidential and my UTAs need to use their judgment and reach out to me and say, no, maybe you want to do a well check with student X. And then I can just do it. And it's this very natural thing. And it opens the door for that student to let me know what's going on. So what are some of your ideas? Um, and for equitable teaching, the analogy, the visual I keep thinking of is, OK, we want to bring everybody to the table. But it can't end there. Everybody has to have a chair. And everybody has to have a chair that will support and hold them up. We can't bring them to the table and then hand them a wobbly chair and expect them to succeed. So using that imagery, what could undergraduate teaching assistants do to make sure that all of our students have sturdy chairs at the table? Well, I, if I can, I'd like to roll your two questions into one because we had a really interesting experience in ETE recently of hiring two UTAs. And, and I think the selection question is so important because so much of our criteria of what a good UTA might entail or what academic success entails is, is white coded in a lot of ways, right? And, and there's a lot of underlying assumptions about, for example, grades and which students are more likely to have high grades and which students are more likely, as you said, Ellen, to actually approach you and express an interest in being a UTA. I mean, there's a lot of self-selection bias that, that, that those students are going through. And, and so when we were hiring these um, UTAs, I think um, we really had to be intentional about our criteria and so with this question about equity, for us that, I mean, that had to be part of the evaluation. Like does this Excellent. student have represent some kind of alternative knowledge that might not be um, often valued in the academy? And so kind of integrating that criteria as specifically like we value this was, um, was interesting because it's so hard all of our usual standards right like is this person have good grades have they right are they come into question when we're thinking about equity and so when this question about what role they can play for me especially in an academy that is overwhelmingly still white cis having students in positions of relative power, um, where as their professors might not be, is really an important part of changing those power dynamics, right? And, and of representation of students being able to actually identify with people in positions of power. And so I see UTFs as kind of this interminary inter space of like, we can't maybe change out all the faculty all at once, but these are positions that get changed out more frequently and we can really do work to make those positions more equitable. 
Wow, so many wonderful things in that sharing, Sam. Um, anybody in the group want to jump off of anything that Sam just shared? Yeah, I think what Sam just shared is really interesting because in the theater department, it's less about um, interviewing and have a meeting a step. It's like, we need a UTF. Is it, does anybody want to do it, right? So we don't, we're not as selective in terms of like the students who are wanting to do it. But what's really interesting, and Sam knows this because we're in a different group together as well, but I'm teaching a contemporary BIPOC playwright class this semester. It's the first time it's ever been taught. And um, the entire class is white, except for the UTF which is great that, that we have a non-white voice in the room to contribute to our very tough conversations about race and ethnicity and all the different pieces that go into that in the world of theater. But what happens sometimes is we'll talk about something and like everybody like looks to the UTF to be like the one non-white person in the room. And so that has been an interesting challenge as well because she's like, I'm not here to do that. Like I'm not gonna be all the things for all the people, which we had talked about as, you know, as a class at the beginning of the semester, but it is really interesting um, kind of thinking about her, her role in the class. And she's already taught a couple times in there just to kind of make sure that her voice is being heard, but mostly she sits, you know, and just kind of observes and listens. But one thing that has been really great about her experience in there too, is because she's a student that so many students already know, um, students have been able to go to her and say like, this, this conversation was really tough for me today. And that, that's something that maybe they didn't want to share with me that they shared with her. And so we've been able to kind of work through some, some like feelings and emotions um, as well as just some of the structure of the class because um, they're so comfortable going to her. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, Samantha, I really appreciated those comments. Um, I'm in, I'm a biologist and so in STEM, um, I mean, we, we utilize a lot of UTAs, but you know, the process is uh, the conversations about who you're going to look for as a TA always revolve around who has taken your class and who has done really well. Um, and I think in the context of this conversation that can just kind of perpetuate the inequities because that is going to more often than not, especially down here in Southern Utah, it's gonna put a particular person in that spot that's gonna resonate with the people in the class that maybe don't need the TA. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's really making me broaden my perspective a little bit about what other aspects should we be looking for besides just this person took my class and was at the top of the class. So they're going to be a great TA for me. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that and that introspection, Matt. I, I, I think I agree with your first part. This person has taken the course that really helps. For, in the fall, some of my UTAs had taken it face to face and they were scrambling just like everybody else because they also gamified the course. And so you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of learning that fall. Um, but this spring semester, I have 18 UTAs and 12 of them took it last fall. And I did not look for who had the highest grades. Fortunately, I had them write a learning plan at the beginning of the semester, check in in the middle and write a reflection at the end. So I combed through those and I looked for individuals that said, I was scared to death at the beginning because I don't have good organizational skills or I didn't get my book right away because I was waiting for my financial aid, but wow, I had some growth and I'm really proud of myself now. And so I invited those. I also asked my current UTAs, who, who in your pod, you know, do you think was um, very active in the group meet chats? And so not necessarily the highest grades, but somebody who is involved and social because we, we need a social person to be a UTA. So I think that's great that you're you know, starting to think, wow, what are some uh, bouncing off of what Sam and Amanda said, what are other ways that we can recruit? Um, I am very fortunate that our undergrad and to a, a decent extent, our faculty and staff is very diverse backgrounds and intentionality for the equity and inclusion, but a, recent higher ed article said that not all groups on Canvas believe that as much progress is being made in that area. And so it's 
with a little effort, it's fairly easy for me to find UTAs that rep represent, reflect the demographics of the students in my class. And I think it's just really important that students see people that they can identify with in these positions. Yeah. Okay, Sam, how are we doing on time? We've said at 10, 10 minutes. We should end up oh, okay. Because okay, I think you're giving me a warning note. Okay, so I would like to hear questions from this group. I've put out my questions. We've got ten minutes. You came to this session, and you may not have gained what you wanted to gain yet. So, what are some other questions that we can use the wisdom of the group to help out with? I have the question of, you said that initially when you went to your, I don't remember if you said Dean or AD, but the right. person. Yes. <laughs> uh, I actually John. call her Linda, who's not my boss. I thought she was my boss my first year. She's not. <laughs> okay. When you went to them to ask and then had to go away and you're saying that they are your, are they taking a class? That part I don't I don't quite okay understand. yeah so um we have there are four hundred level courses here it's four ninety two for us it's called independent study and so that's a very generic term they can do it for one two or three credits and I have them do it for one credit and I assign them a pod I I randomize my large class and so this semester their pods are fourteen or fifteen students. Because it's on the books, then I have a canvas shell for it. And so I have discussion posts for my 18 undergraduate teaching assistants. They, we do a group project, although we make several group projects. And I really throw it at them. I'm like, by this date, let's come up with a list of group projects. OK, we've got a list of group projects. And some have to do with making screencasts of how to navigate Last semester it was, let's put together the start of a handbook for undergraduate teaching assistants for this course. So they've come up with lots of ideas I would have never come up with. And then we had to decide to put them in the different projects. And so I said, okay, I want three volunteers to come up with a way that people can choose which projects they're in. So really turn it over to them. I heard April Alexander speak um, she's a forensic psychology professor at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and something she said really stuck in my head. She said, I don't do anything without an undergraduate student attached to my hip. And, and that really resonated with me. We, we work so hard, but so much of what we do, we could be providing an experiential opportunity for a student. And you know, we get joy out of interacting with our students. That's what's so hard about this distance learning. So my one-on-one -on -one meetings with students since I've adopted, I never do anything without an undergraduate attached to my hip, has really energized me. I have. So part of my question was also around I guess because we have students and they run out of financial aid, so it seems like a tax for them to have to pay to take a class to be helped Got to it. help. So I'm right. wondering if there are any options. Are are people paying? Are they getting paid at some places? And so it right. does seem like there could be maybe two different ways because some students may be able to afford to pay. Right, um, and let's not care. limit it to two. Let's say let's keep finding and asking until we find a way. So it does sound like an Amanda nodded or had some. Yeah, are there pay at least in the theater department the stipend. across campus? But if the, it's a job on campus, it, they don't get any college credit for it. Okay, so mm -hmm. I had to do that because um, I'm at an R1, and my colleagues have huge grants, and they pay their students, but I don't. And there were not any work study positions, so I said we can do it for credit. And the way our structure is, as long as they don't go over, it's not per credit. They're they're full time. So I, I fully acknowledge that different institutions have different structures. And so, um, yeah, we have to keep asking the questions. And so, um, Juan, you didn't mention what 
Um, if you're comfortable sharing what institution you're at, how large is it, how, what program? I'm at Salt Lake Community College. Um, oh, so community college, yeah. okay, so they're there for two yeah. years. Yes, well, <laughs> in theory. <laughs> In theory, there. In theory, right. Well, that's not true. Right. That's not actually accurate. Right. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Um, and I teach. I'm um, adjunct. Well, I just moved to a staff position from congrats. a faculty position, but I'm congrats. also still teaching adjunct, and so I am interested in helping faculty to do this because I think it could actually bring some equity and inclusivity into the class by having students' voices. And absolutely, absolutely. But like um, some balance between not overutilizing them, like not abusing them in some way. Right. Absolutely. So I wonder if you can use your new position as leveraged to say, hmm, how do other departments do this? Is there anybody else on campus doing this? And how did they do it? And if I have to compete for work study money, how do I find out? Yeah, it, it brought in my network on successful tips to get that work study position. Which, which field are you in? So I was in social work, but I'm also still teaching African-American um, culture. Okay. Ethnic studies. Right, so anything you can leverage about the type of course you teach and Coming away from the theme with this, you will be modeling equity and inclusion by having some of these work study positions in your class. That might be tempting for an administrator to latch on to. Yeah. All right, well, we've only got about two more minutes and I am going to invite everyone. I'm gonna drop in the chat two different links. So one of them is a feedback um, just to to give feedback about the sessions, how they're going, how is it easy to find things, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first link. And then the second link is to the Mighty Networks event for this event. And um, I'm gonna steal the last minute because my field is technical writing. And so I would be really interested to use that space in that event. If anyone has, um, policies or things that you're writing because as amanda mentioned um right there can be a if we're going to make these positions equitable that might put students in in a vulnerable position right where students are being asked to represent cultures um or being utilized in ways that we don't want right and so i wonder if people have suggestions words i'm so i'm into policy because that's my that's what i study so i if anybody's got some like chunks in a syllabus or ellen you said maybe you've made a handbook so if there's some language that folks are using to like make it really explicit like this is what this person does and this is what this person does not do i i would personally find that super useful so i invite us to use this um space as to continue our conversation mm -hmm. Um, Ellen, I don't know, do you have any kind of closing words before we sign off? No, really, I, uh, those tasks that you're asking them to do are super important for the success of the conference. So I'm not gonna take away that time. My email is here. Um, I would love to continue the conversation and, and hear from you on and, and find out, yes, I got these going at my college. Super, well, thank you so much, Attending. Ellen. And thanks everyone for attending. That was a really great conversation and um, we'll just continue it online. So I hope to see some of you in the, in the rest of the sessions and take care. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, Ellen, that was great. Okay, thank you. Before you Hold on one minute while I get the, co the email off of here. Yep. Where it's closed down. Yeah, that's right. Ellen, you might oh, drop your email to too in that. Oh yes, um, thank you. That would be that would be good. The QR code is in some funny position where my phone can't get to Okay, it. no problem. Um you can also, Ellen, in that I hate to be pushing this mighty networks, but you can up attach files. So if you felt comfortable sharing your presentation sure. with that QR code, then folks could go in there and, and use it, which might be or you, anyway, so those are just some options. It took me a second to find the chat because I still was sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and Did 
I'm gonna stop recording. We don't need to see this. <laughs>